For the big picture, let's bring in Chuck Lieberman, Chief Investment Officer of Advisors Capital Management. He's a former economist at the Federal Reserve and former Chief Economist at Chase before it joined J.P. Morgan. And that reminds me of something that David Rosenberg told us earlier. He said if you look at uh, the money that the Fed puts out there in the markets, the correlation is very high. What do you think about a QE3? Why don't you weigh in on this? I don't think there's much of a chance of it at all. There's, there's a greater chance that the Fed doesn't even complete QE2 than they implement the QE3. Uh, the Fed put a lot of uh, credit into the system, a lot of liquidity into the system. The banks didn't lend that much. Uh, the system is slowly but surely coming back. We see the economy gathering momentum. There's been job growth every month uh, last year. That's great, but we need to see larger job gains. Uh, the economy seems to be building momentum, which is all good. So uh, I, I just don't see the basis for QE3. You're still bullish, though, on the stock market. So without any more Fed money and with, with the Fed getting kind of more hawkish as well, as far mm -hmm. as rates are concerned, you're still bullish this market. Sure, for the same reason that the Fed is less inclined to put credit into the system. If the economy gets healthier, the economy does not need special dispensation, special support from the Fed to uh, grow. So the Fed can get out of the way and let the economy just grow on its own, which it's slowly but surely doing. I want to bring in another bull here quickly, J.P. Morgan's Thomas Lee, one of the most bullish strategists out there. He told Bloomberg, we've already hit the bottom for this year. Listen up. The week of March 11th was probably marking the low we were looking for. You know, we were looking for 1250, and I think the combination of escalation in the Middle East plus the, the natural disaster, I think really accelerated the process. So I, we're pretty sure that 1250 was the low for the year. And if you look at the chart, actually, the S&P chart year to date, it's pretty striking, the low that we that we hit. Do you think that's it for the year or do we see another correction? Well, there's one more risk, which is a repetition, shall we say, of what occurred in 2010. The economy was doing very, very well. The markets were doing very well. And then Greece blew up. And we have not yet seen the adverse effect of, of the uh, oil price increase because of Libya or the fallout in GDP terms from what happened in Japan. Uh, that's going to curtail production. It's going to have a small effect, a very tiny effect on Q1 because it occurred in March. But the bigger effect will occur in Q2. So it will depress the economic growth. But, but I think that the underlying trend is still very strong. There will be even more strength later as we rebuild, as the Japanese rebuild in particular. That's going to lead to more uh, demand for U.S. products. So we're going to see a pickup in activity in the second half of the year. What do you think, Steve, about the momentum trade? I mean, it was on at the beginning of the year. You bought every dip, mm -hmm. uh, and you were successful on that strategy. Then we obviously had the earthquake and the problems in the Middle East leading to a drop in the market. But now, at least the last week and a half... Not, not, not including today's drops, obviously. It's, you've seen some really strong momentum on the, on the upside. Well, it's been, the market's been very resilient. You know, you, we saw down here, I'm standing in front of the VIX pit, we saw the volatility index pop up to 30 from in the teens, the 17, 18 level. And within five days, we're right back at 18. So that tells me, as, as the other two gentlemen here um, are, are kind of alluding to that I think that there's some strength in this market and it's it's resilient you know unless there is something some event that that occurs that's really going to derail it and then oil pricing back up to the levels that we saw you know a couple years ago could be that event I think we're back on track to sort of get that momentum back in place let me ask you Chuck where you put your money if you're bullish this whole market I mean which sectors do you think make the most sense well the way we're positioned we're very much uh, looking at the uh, cyclically sensitive parts of the of the market so because we think the economy will do well we want to ride that wave that means consumer discretionary it means financials it means industrials those are the parts that will respond to the economy and those are the parts of the market that have the greatest upside now Steve mentions oil you see the auto sector here it's obvious industrials needed as well is the commodities rally that we that we saw is that over or does it not concern you as far as crude is concerned well forget about crude crude is a special beast because uh, that's responding to market fees because of Libya and the potential for more fallout elsewhere in the Middle East. That has nothing to do with demand. Uh, the rest of the industrials reflect the strength of China, uh, probably will reflect more strength going forward, uh, rebuilding in, in Japan. Uh, so I expect the materials sector to continue to do well. And that's another area that we have exposure to as well. We hey. think it's good. 
Hey, Chuck, you mentioned uh, consumer discretionary as yes. well. I mean, what about the oil effect or the more, more importantly, the gasoline effect there? I mean, I went to fill up this weekend and saw gasoline well over $4 a gallon. I mean, even if it doesn't, you know, you don't see a one-to-one, -one, one cent it goes up, one cent less of spending. What about the psychological effect on consumers? Well, offsetting the psychological effect is the fact that we are creating more jobs and incomes are growing. So we actually have a lot of exposure to the auto sector. Uh, if throughout the pipeline, throughout the chain. So we like Ford, for example, at the assembly level, uh, the rate of uh, car sales today is still lower than the rate at which we're junking cars. There's another 10% of upside just so we match the rate at which we're junking cars. So that's great for auto sales, for auto assemblies. We like some of the parts suppliers, uh, Magna. We like uh, TRW. Uh, they'll be uh, beneficiaries of the parts that go into cars. And we like Penske as a, set, uh, as a distributor. As a retailer, again, playing off that same theme. I hey, think, hey, think there's hey, a lot of opportunity there. Well, th there was a great story this morning saying 600,000 cars could be affected. Adam, what are you hearing about Japanese auto plants uh, and, and the supply chain problems? Yeah, well, it's not just that Toyota has to shut down or Honda has to shut down. It's all these little parts that come out of Japan, whether it's the display on a radio, whether that's the knob on the, uh, the air conditioner, uh, whether it's even the black paint, for the Ford 150, as, as you, you just mentioned that number, 600,000, think of that. What if 600,000 cars couldn't be made because you couldn't get all those parts? That's the issue that auto companies are facing. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at the performance over the past month, say Ford versus Toyota and Honda, you'll see Toyota and Honda leading way down, Ford starting to come down. So, Chuck, I, I guess I have to ask you, uh, I'm, I'm told, by the way, we can still get our chrome spinners. They're made in good old Brooklyn, New York. But <laughs> Adam likes those 22-inch spinners. I kind of like the spinners in chrome. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the real issue for investors, do does Ford follow down Honda and Toyota, or do Toyota and Honda bounce back and go back up towards Ford? How do you play it? Well, you play it with the domestic players, because obviously the domestic companies are going to be much better positioned relative to the Japanese players. The Japanese players are the ones who are going to suffer most of those losses in production. Some U.S. players may also. You mentioned the black paint. Well, it'll be uh, the, the flip side of that line of Ford. You can have any color you want, except for, as long as it's black. Now it's going to be you can have any line car you want, any color you want, except for black. So they'll be able to continue to sell vehicles. In fact, they may be able to increase production of other vehicles where all the parts are source, sourced domestically and pick up some market share because the Japanese just can't supply product to the market. Steve, let me ask you about these day-to-day -day moves because your uh, investment time horizon is obviously much shorter than Chuck's or, or any regular investor watching the show. Mm -hmm. What do you do about these black swan events that we talk about? And they're very serious. I don't want to belittle uh, what happened in Japan, what's happening in the Middle East, the problem in Europe. But if you look at last year, the, uh, the Gulf oil spill, the Goldman Sachs problems in Congress, uh, these things are for almost forgotten at this point. I mean, how do you deal with that as a trader? Well, I mean, I, it's really a question of how, how we perceive the reaction to those events to be. And that's kind of what I alluded to previous, in my uh, previous conversation was, you know, how quickly the VIX, the volatility index moved back down. So in, in, in addressing your question about the time frame of, the, of our investment choices and what we're seeing the traders do, um, we have to look at things that are on a shorter time horizon. For example, you know, end of quarter Thursday and unemployment Friday. That's really, of course, we're always looking at the bigger picture, but we're also looking at the smaller picture because, you know, that again, as you said, that's how we're making our investment decisions and our trading decisions here. So those tend to get pushed up in the focal point. Of course, and, and you look at it the other way, obviously taking right. the longer term view. Uh, as far as time horizons, we only have 20 seconds left, so I have to say thank you, Chuck, thank for you. joining us. Charles Lieberman there uh, from Advisors Capital Management. Thank you to Steve Quirk as thank well.